Good morning, folks. How are we on this cool morning, but beautiful morning? As you know, Peter Nett is in Dubbo this morning. Who would rather be on the Gold Coast than Dubbo? <laughs> he did very well in Melbourne last week. They got some um, firsts, some seconds, some thirds, some fourths, some fifths. So some of their chickens were on the podium a couple of times, I understand. So um, that's, uh, that went very well for them, but no doubt looking for uh, a continuation of that at Dubbo this weekend. So we're on our own, folks, and I'm afraid you, uh, you've got me this morning. So I hope that's going to be all right. Okay, I thought for our, our focus this morning is going to be on Christian, of Christian witness. And uh, last week we read a passage uh, from Isaiah 55, and I thought we'd extend that this morning because it sort of uh, centers in on what we as Christians need to be thinking about and how we approach our Christian witness and the result of that. So, for the invitation to worship, let me just read to you from Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters and you will have no money. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the people, a leader and a commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so, so that it, see, it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy. Be led forth in peace, and the mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree, instead of the briars the myrtle will grow. This will be the Lord's renown for an everlasting sign, which will not be destroyed. These are indeed the word of our Lord. To commence this morning, let's sing. Let's stand up and sing. We have two little choruses to sing. And we'll start with Come and Let Us Sing. Please be upstanding.
in Jesus Christ the Lord, we are a new creation. Some you go in there a bit musty. 
Ours does. Ours is great. <laughs> I don't know why, but um, we have those air extractors, and we turn them on every night, and I think that that really helps. Um, so that's a nice. And we even had one lady phone us back after she'd been in the shop, and then later in the afternoon she phoned us and said how lovely um, her experience was at the op shop, and how you know she just couldn't say enough good about us. Um, so that. It was just such a wonderful day. I don't know, it all just went so smoothly and it was great. Okay, that's all I have to say. Before you go, oh. um, my is up here. Come up because uh, I want to thank these people. They put a lot of energy into the life of this congregation, as you know. And they're heading off for a little journey. And let's pray a blessing on them as they continue to Loving God, we thank you for Graham and Laura and the work they do for this congregation. And as they travel, we pray that you will watch over them, that they will have wonderful experiences of this land, and that they may meet people and, uh, and just be relaxed in your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, in terms of the results from the Friday, uh, could you just put that up for me? It was quite impressive. There was a concern because um, obviously craft fair is a major contributor to the funds of the church and there was a concern if we did it one day you know how well would that go five thousand two hundred forty three dollars forty four dollars <laughs> we can all give our, our, ourselves a clap but let's remember lisa and vicky that sort of coordinated things and i'd just like to point out sue Kurtz. she copped it uh, last night <laughs> with the poor woman that hadn't come late and hadn't expected it all to be cleared up. She handled that for us. So it's great that the, the whole church comes together in this way and um, it, I'll, I'll have the final figures in a report to, to church council. Um, thanks, Peter. Okay. Uh, children's message. Uh, well, we're just going to uh, come and do our children's message. This is the situation. We, um, if children want a tuck shop or something from the tuck shop, they need to order it in the morning or mum can ring the tuck shop and order it. Um, generally, the kids don't have money. It, it goes straight to the tuck shop. The parents have like an account and that they can pay for. And that's then done and then tuck shop comes to the classroom at lunchtime in time for lunch. Well, if you don't order your tuck shop then, then you can get it at lunchtime. It means that if you're in Peter 3, prep to grade 3, you see your teacher. Your teacher rings your mum. Your mum authorises the tuck shop to make you some food. The tuck shop makes the food. The food comes down eventually to the classroom. Of course, by this time, the whole rest of the class is, has finished eating and is out playing on the oval. So then you need to sit on your own and eat your lunch that has come from tuck shop at that time. So it's not an option that many of the kids would take. And this day, I had a, a little prep class and they were having their lunch. And they used to sit in their little groups of about four um, to have their lunch. And little Mark was sitting there with them. He didn't say anything. He looked pretty sad. He wasn't upset, he wasn't crying, but he did look pretty sad. And the others sat down and started getting out their lunch. And he just sat. And 
Jane looked up and she said to him, where's your lunch? He said, I left it on the kitchen bench. Mummy did tell me to put it in my bag and I forgot. She didn't say anything else. She just got her lunch out and she looked and she said, my mummy always cuts my sandwiches into four. I could give you one and I'd still have plenty. And she gave him one of her sandwiches. A little smile came on his face. And then next door to them was Andy. And he looked and he said, Oh, Mum always cuts my apple in lots of pieces. There's plenty here. You could have two of my apple pieces and I'd still have plenty. And he gave him two of his apple pieces. And the smile got a little bit bigger. And at this stage, Joseph, who was a bit of a scallywag, looked at his lunch and he said, oh, mum's given me tomatoes again. <laughs> I could share them with you. And I've got some biscuits as well. Would you like to have some biscuits and some of my tomatoes? And the smile got bigger. And they all sat there and they all just ate their lunch. And everybody had enough. He had plenty because he had a little bit of everyone's. And he was able to run off and play as soon as the bell went to play. And the others didn't take half their lunch home in their bag, which was often the case. I thought it was really nice because nobody said, now, come on, share your lunch. Now, I think we all said to our kids, now, here's, a, here's some biscuits. Now, go and share with your sister. Go and share with your brother, which they do because we said, go and share. But nobody said, go and share. Nobody said, you've got to do this. It was out of their own generosity and their plenty. They had plenty and out of their plenty they shared with him. And I think that's really important for us that we have plenty and out of our plenty we can just share a little bit so that everybody has enough. So thank you. Thanks, Nola. Isn't that important for our Christian witness that we do indeed share with those in need? Okay, we come to a time of, of prayer, um, and we have a <coughs> we, um, focus on, at this point, our confession. It's important that we come together, at least weekly, I think, and focus on confessing to our Lord. Please join me in prayer of confession. Heavenly Father and Almighty God, we are thankful that your mercy is higher than the heavens, wider than our wanderings, and deeper than all our sin. Forgive our careless attitudes towards your purposes. Please forgive our hesitancy to relieve the suffering of others, our envy of those who have more than we have our obsession with creating a life of pleasure, our indifference to the treasures of heaven, our neglect of your wise and gracious counsel. Heavenly Father, help us to change our way of life so that we may desire what is good, love what you love, and trust in your promises. Give us confidence in the hope we have through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. Let's pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness to us. And we offer back to you a portion of that with which you have blessed us. With those take the offering and the Lord. give thanks. Lord, you are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy you have given us so much. We give you this offering today as a worship to you. Use it for your kingdom and glory.
all. Romans 5, 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we are going to reflect on the importance of our Christian witness. As followers of Jesus, we are called to be his ambassadors, shining his light in a world that desperately needs the hope, love, and truth found in the gospel. Our witness is not limited to mere words, but encompasses our entire lives. Let us delve deeper into the significance of our Christian witness and how it can transform the lives and impact the world around us. That was written by Chat GPT. And I include that because I think it's spot on. The genesis of this message was actually a couple of months ago uh, when uh, Lorna and I were, had the privilege of uh, visiting Jerusalem. <clears throat> and we went to the Lutheran Reformed Church in the Old City. <coughs> and uh, we had met the minister and her son. Uh, two weeks prior in Iraq, and we went, because we were there a Sunday morning, we went to their service, and her, her son was actually doing, a, as part of a confirmation program, uh, the message that morning. So there were three young men doing confirmation, and he uh, gave the message, and it was on the importance of our Christian witness. And it got me thinking that it is very important, and maybe we should focus on that a little bit more. I, I think when it comes to witnessing, we get hung up on words, right? We don't know what to say. We sort of feel inadequate, and we don't say anything. And we miss an opportunity uh, to spread the gospel. Uh, it's not just what we say, though. It's what we do as well. And, and you know, when we whinge about our neighbor when they blow their leaves onto our property, that's, that happens for us. One of the neighbors gets his his uh, grass done by one of these services, and of course the service wants to make sure his grass looks really good, so it blows all the leaves off his grass and ends up on the <coughs> neighbor's property. We, we whinge when they park on the nature strip in front of our place, right? Or we whinge when they cut the grass at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning, right? Uh, but these are the sorts of things that we need to, to as a Christian, what sort of witness is that? Uh, for me, it's driving. Okay. Um, I don't mind. I don't mind how slow a person drives, provided they don't do it in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, it, it, and, um, and Lorna will attest. I, I do get some frustrated, <laughs> and that's why I don't put one of those little fish on the back of my head. <laughs> it would not be a good witness. This is a male thing, isn't it? Who, who, who here thinks they're a better than average driver? <laughs> we can't all be better than average, can we? Anyway, uh, so it's what we do is is it's important, I think, is what we say when it comes to to our Christian witness. So let's delve a little bit deeper into understanding what our, our, Christ, our Christian witness is all about, because. And it's vitally important for the progress of uh, the Metropolitan Uniting Church and the outreach into the community. We can't have an outreach into the community unless people really do enjoy uh, meeting with us and doing things with us. It's great to hear about the story in the opera. How many of us have ever gone into a shop and complimented them on what they do? You know, if there's something on the floor, we whinge, right? But compliments come a bit harder, don't they? Uh, so. Uh, 
if we are going to do this outreach into the community, we've got to get this right. And I go so far to say, we've got to have a, an ache inside us for all those people that are driving past this property. There's 10,000 cars a day that goes past our property. So this morning now, why are these cars driving past and not driving in? We, we've got to have a concern and ache for those that don't know the message of the gospel. Now, one thing we need to realize is it's not all up to us, right? If we're talking to somebody and they don't drop on their knees and, and pray the sinner's prayer, we shouldn't get discouraged, right? It's not up to us, it's 100% up to the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts people of their sin. All we can do is help. I think there's, there's three things that we need to realize. Um, the first thing is that the gospel is the, the whole truth of being saved by our belief in Christ is a mystery. Right? Paul says that in, in uh, Colossians 1. I have become its servant by the commission of God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, he says. The mystery is that it has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. That's us, folks. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory of glory that we need to proclaim to those around us. We proclaim him, that's, that's Jesus, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. So that's a mystery. Right? People don't understand fully. Neither do we. It, it's, it's also, you know, when we're talking to somebody, we have to remember that they're aliens. Paul says so in the passage just before that in, in, in Colossians 1. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that's in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. That's who we're talking to, aliens. But now he has reconciled you to Christ, this, by Christ's physical body, through, the, through death, and presented you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm not moved from the hope held out into the gospel. So, keep in mind, as we're talking to people, you can't expect them to understand right away. Okay? It's that relationship you're going to build that's going to help them uh, uh, and give them that Holy Spirit opportunity to, to convict them. The third point is, we only see dimly. It says in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Uh, back in these times, they didn't have very good mirrors. I, I, I learned that um, when we were in Cairo, we went to the Egypt um, Museum, uh, which is actually a bit of a disappointment. I was there 20 years earlier, and I don't think any of those cards had changed. You know, the descriptions on them. And in one of the cases, they had a display of mirrors from the time of the pharaohs. And all they were was a bit of polished metal. Back then, people didn't see themselves clearly as we do see when we go and look in a mirror. Right? Uh, it was just a poor reflection. And that's what Paul's saying here. Now we see but a poor reflection. We don't fully understand. And actually, a human mind can't possibly fully understand. So, with those constraints, it's a mystery, we're talking to aliens, and we only see dimly, we can't expect 
you know, lights to turn on here and there, you know, it's going to take a while. What's important is we have that relationship with people uh, that allows the Holy Spirit to work. And I thought, you know, what should we do in terms of a plan? How should we move? How should we move, move, move ahead? And it's, it's, it's becoming more, more uh, I, I, I believe, important that we just get people to read their Bible. This come, came up with Connect Group. It's important we need to get people into uh, reading the Bible. So possibly if you get that opportunity in a discussion to say, well, why don't you do something for me? Well, actually you can say, why don't you do something for yourself? And get a Bible and read first page and the last page. Okay. That's not too difficult, is it? I mean, back when I was a youth, we had the, those um, Gospels of John. They said, you've got to read the Gospel of John. And we had those little, little Gospels that we could hand to people. Well, um, I don't know how many people actually read the whole thing, but you could read the front first, first page and the last page. That's not too much to ask. Okay? If, it's, if it's a woman, you can actually give them a Bible and say, here you go. If it's a man, don't. Say, so go find a Bible and read the first page and the last page. Um, I don't know whether you've read that book, um, Why Men Hate Church. Uh, Peter led it to me last year. Um, and it explains that men don't want to come sit in the chair here and have morning tea. No, they don't get off on that. They get, up, get off on a challenge. So give them a challenge. They go find yourself a Bible and read the first page and the last page. What will they understand from the first page? Creation, right? God created out of nothing. What well, King James says, chaos. Uh, earth was created. What would they hear to read on the back page? The, the new, new, new earth, new heaven. Yeah. Uh, to my mind, that is basically saying this is the this is time. Okay. It began, began in Genesis, and uh, eternity starts in Revelation. And so this period of time, and if you're into chaos theory, it's uh, synchronicity, a period of synchronicity that we're in at the moment, um, explains everything. And, and, and there's, there's, there's nowhere else that people, people, people get, that, uh, get that. Um, okay, what if they then come back and say, okay, tell me some more. Then I suggest you look at Revelation, sorry, Romans 5, Romans 5, 1 to 5. Could we put that up here? It's the passage that Sue read for us. And it's, it's got the gospel in, in a nutshell. Therefore, since we have been justified through, by faith, so through faith, it's their faith that's going to do this. Right? They've got to have faith in Jesus as their personal Savior, and that then is going to allow them, to, the Holy Spirit in them, to, to, to commune and understand more. And understand what they're reading. Uh, we have peace with God, and so the result is going to be peace with God. You know, most people are anxious, most non-Christians are anxious about, they don't really understand, they know the Bible's important, but they've never read it. Uh, they know there is a God, but mm, they don't really understand much about it. There's an anxiety there. And, but we will have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace. Okay, it's God's grace that's allowing this to happen. And people need to understand that. In which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. That's the focus we need to have, is the hope uh, that we as, as Christians share. Not only so, but we, all, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance character, and character hope. We as Christians will have that character uh, that's built on uh, our understanding. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. Isn't that wonderful? Through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It's brilliant, isn't it? I don't know if any of you saw that um, Netflix uh, program, The Silent. It's um, very well done. It's well acted. Superb cinematography. Very impressive, the sites they go to. The, one, one of the sequences is, was actually filmed at the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. 
Now, I know how difficult it is to get to the of the Rock from Jerusalem. I can't understand how they got a whole film group up there. But it's quite a brilliant program. Sadly, it's not being renewed because of religious criticism that some have taken. It basically juxtaposes um, an Islamic approach to a Messiah and a Christian approach to a Messiah, compares and contrasts. And so it starts in Jordan, uh, where there's this leader, these people, uh, uh, towards Israel, and of course they can't get in because of the fence there, uh, but there's a follow that's left to lead the group. Uh, the next series, uh, program is in, in, in North America, and what shows what happens to the church community, and then they march on Washington. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's very impressive in, in what it's done. But you know, never once mentions the Bible. And the Bible is the differentiating, uh, what should we say, the Word of God must differentiate us. I can explain the Quran, which was written by Muhammad, Muhammad in, the Prophet Muhammad in um, 700, in the 7th century. 6th, say, I can't remember, but that's the 7th century. Uh, the Bible, there's 66 books written over by over 40 people and coherent and consistent and starts, as we said, from the beginning uh, to the end. <clears throat> uh, it's, has, I can't explain it other than it is indeed the Word of God. What about then the impact of our Christian witness? Significant. We will be a light in the darkness. In a world filled with despair, hopelessness, sin, our Christian witness will stand out as a beacon of light. Our lives and words have the potential to lead others out of darkness and into marvelous light, the light of Christ. And by living authentically and demonstrating the power of the gospel, we will inspire others to seek the truth. So we will help change lives. Our witness has the power to transform lives. Then others will experience the joy, the peace, and the transformation that Christ brings. <coughs> they are drawn to the one source of our hope. Through our actions, we will have the privilege of introducing others to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Isn't that brilliant? In conclusion, <coughs> let's uh, consider what our Christian wit. Uh, uh, a Christian witness is a sacred responsibility and a divine privilege. And I, I, I think some that were great words from the, that uh, preacher Charles Spurgeon. Okay. Uh, he put it brilliantly. Let me read it to you. How much do you owe to our Lord? Has he ever done anything for you? Has he forgiven your sins? Has he covered you with a robe of righteousness? Has he set your feet on a rock? Has he established your going out and coming in? Has he prepared heaven for you? Has he prepared you for heaven? Has he written your name in the book of life? Has he given you countless blessings? Has he laid up for you a store of mercies? Then do something for Jesus worthy of his life. He went, Ben adds, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may we be filled with the Holy Spirit, empowering us to be bold, witnesses for Christ. Let us live lives that reflect his love and compassion and grace so that the world may see him in us and come to know him as their Lord and Savior. May our Christian witness shine brightly, illuminating the path that leads to his eternal life. Our hymn for today is immortal.
immortal, invisible. And we be upstanding and sing this wonderful hymn. Standing.
without fault and with great joy. Be the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord.